Welcome to the National Sculpture Society offices in New York City on February 14th, 2024. Uh, thank you for spending a portion of your Valentine's Day with us. The title of today's program is Sculpture in the Time of Artificial Intelligence. It's a hot topic and we're very fortunate to have access to an expert in the field willing to share his knowledge. We're going to jump across the continent to Northern California um, to meet our presenters. Um, Lance Glasser is the ambassador of the NSS Northern California community. He's doing an excellent job organizing opportunities for sculptors there. In September, the NorCal community exhibited as a group at the Reno Tahoe International Art Show in Nevada and they've been invited back this year. Today's program was his idea. Lance's friend, Andrew Bridges, is a technology lawyer with experience in copyright, trademark, and publicity law disputes. Andrew and Lance will discuss the unfolding controversies surrounding artificial intelligence and its application to art, specifically to sculpture. So Lance and Andrew, I am spotlighting you. Thank you. Welcome. And happy, and happy Valentine's Day to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. You're on screen and I'm going to disappear and mute myself. If, before I disappear completely, if I could please just ask everyone to kindly remain muted unless um, Lance or Andrew ask you to unmute. Um, enter any questions in the chat room. Lance will read your question aloud to Andrew and um, we encourage your participation, but it just saves everyone from jumping in at once and then no one can hear anything. So I thank you for that. And welcome gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Great, thank you and remind everybody that this is being recorded. And for those of you who listen to the recording at a future date, law uh, changes, uh, circumstances change. So uh, take that into account uh, as you hear what we say today. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, you know, you're, everyone knows you as a renowned tech and free speech lawyer, a free speech lawyer with uh, Fenwick. Uh, for those on the line, he has litigated numerous consequential cases, uh, including the one that enables uh, Google search. So, and many other uh, cases that he's worked on are today taught in law schools. So he's joining us to help us understand what the rise of AI means for sculptors and do that in the context of uh, copyright and, and other laws. So uh, without uh, any further ado, Andrew, take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lance. Uh, thank you all of you who have joined and uh, I wish you a happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm honored to be asked to speak on this today. And uh, uh, I should say it, it's nice to be described as an expert, but you know, when everybody is still standing on the starting line, everybody is a leader. Uh, and to a certain extent, the law is still on the starting line here. There are some, uh, there's some guidance that's available from authoritative sources, but uh, everyone, uh, lawyers and courts and clients are feeling their way ahead in this uh, environment. And I hope to shed some light on that. I'd like to start by just addressing some of the general uh, characteristics of artificial intelligence and what has uh, been emerging as its effects on the marketplace or on society. Uh, there are, are debates about the meaning of artificial intelligence itself. Uh, for some people, it means machine-based le learning where, um, where systems improve themselves and become semi-autonomous. Uh, other contexts, it just means application of algorithms to enormous data sets. Um, some people, uh, I think myself included, like to say 
the problem with the term artificial intelligence is that it implies intelligence, which it isn't. Um, so uh, I'm not going to get into all of those debates, but I want to talk about the things that people are sort of currently uh, focusing on right now. Um, the implications in the art world are, are these. First of all, there is a lower requirement of effort or investment by people who call themselves artists uh, in creating artworks. There is There are lower investment and effort required of malefactors to do bad things regarding other people's works. Uh, standards and tastes in the art world may change. Um, and, and patterns may change enormously. Think about the way, for example, that photography uh, came about and sort of changed the world of drawing and painting, where, where uh, photography both in some respects improved upon from, from certain criteria, uh, the outputs of drawers and painters, but then also painters were influenced by photography uh, and it transformed the, the universe of the art world and the experience of art in the, in the public. Think about the way in music, the way synthesizers uh, came in, in instead of uh, mere instruments in musical performances and musical recordings. And then the art and field of music adapted to the presence of synthesizers and then used them to its own purposes to expand and modify the field. Um, I think among other practical effects of a lot of what we're seeing now is the reduced need for studio assistance, uh, for models, for example, because uh, you can now conjure up uh, an image of somebody without actually having a person in the studio, whether it's an art studio or a photographic studio. I think there may be an effect on the perception of value of art. Uh, some art may be valued according to how much effort is thought to be put into the work. Some art may be valued according to how scarce it is. Uh, and uh, the developments can change both scarcity and effort. Um, there may be uh, value associated with ingenuity and human creativity. And the question is whether with tools that allow people to accomplish so much more um, with, with maybe less uh, intellectual contribution that may have an effect on value. Uh, and it may affect just the whole calculus of uh, the reward uh, based on either a creative spark or or effort uh, to and, and its ratio to the the work and effort that went into it. Uh, artificial intelligence and these large data sets have also really created a lot of confusion among the public. There's uh, confusion regarding if somebody sees an output. They don't know necessarily what created that output. They don't know if it's a photograph or if it's something that was conjured up by an algorithm. Um, something may, uh, some graphic art or something that may appear to be a painting may not actually be a painting. Uh, it just was made to look like a painting by computers and algorithms. So there can be a confusion regarding uh, the, the effort and attention that went into something, confusion that, that could relate to the degree of creativity that went into something. Uh, a big issue and a political issue is confusion regarding what the source of the work is, how authentic it is. And of course, this is not new. Uh, any reproduction mechanism going from uh, wood blocks to the printing press, uh, maybe going back as far as the styluses uh, and, and pen and pencil and paper, uh, there can be confusion as to whether somebody is dealing with the quote unquote 
real thing or not. Um, and I'll give you an example. I mean, if, uh, if somebody goes to the Rodin Sculpture Garden in, uh, at Stanford University, uh, which was a notable uh, gift and a notable component of the art museum there, are they really Rodin's or not if they were all cast after Rodin's death? I mean, that's a very low-tech uh, introduction to the problem of what constitutes a genuine uh, artwork um, uh, or, or genuine in the sense of a genuine work of a particular artist. And then there are also questions that I think are less relevant here, but questions about confusion regarding faithfulness to reality is something... Uh, really as it is depicted in a work of art? Uh, is there an explicit deception or an implicit deception? So all of these are, um, are, are issues that are brought to the fore in uh, the current controversies. Now, I'll sort of lay my cards on the table a little bit. Um, copyright, I've done a lot of work in copyright litigation, uh, and I've, and Copyright was like modern American politics 25 years before modern American politics. Uh, very, very adversarial, uh, vituperative, personal attacks. There are armed camps in the field of copyright law. We saw a taste of it in the recent Supreme Court's decision over the Andy Warhol adaptation of a photograph by Lynn Goldsmith, where the majority opinion written by Justice Sotomayor and the dissenting opinion written by Justice Kagan on a question of fair use was remarkably nasty and vituperative between two justices that are sort of on the same side of things generally politically. So copyright law has been like that for all of my career. It's been very, very high intensity conflict. Uh, the other thing is part of the political battles around copyright law have involved what I call moral panics or others call them moral panics as well. This great emphasis, that, oh my God, the sky is falling. It's terrible. Everything has to be revamped. For those of you who um, may not remember it, the Betamax was extremely controversial when it came out and allowed persons to record entire programs off TV for the purposes of watching them at a later time. The Motion Picture Association's uh, head at the time, Jack Valenti, testified before Congress that the Betamax was to the motion picture industry as the Boston Strangler was to a woman home alone. That's the type of discourse that we've had in copyright law. I'm seeing a lot of that now. People saying uh, artificial intelligence and these new models are destroying my livelihood. They're, they're going to destroy some characteristic of American culture or society or what have you. And my view is that all of these fields have always adapted. Uh, courts have adapted. The, um, the industries, the artists, the workers have adapted. And overall, I don't think people will say that all the technological developments uh, yeah. I don't think people will say that all the technological developments of the past hundred years have impoverished the field of art. Uh, I think uh, they may have impoverished certain sectors of it, but I think that they have uh, enormously uh, grown the creative universe uh, in our society. So that's sort of the overall background. I'd like to talk about some specific uh, types of legal issues. And they generally fall within a realm that many people call intellectual property. Uh, but I want to point out that intellectual property is not a coherent concept. Um, 
and this is an important thing to know. There are four or five or maybe even six different areas of the law that people call intellectual property. I try to avoid it myself because they are as different from each other as chalk and cheese. Um, the ones that are typically thought of are patent, copyright, trademark, um, and publicity law, right of publicity law. Patents I'm not going to talk about. Uh, there may be patents in artificial intelligence technologies. Patents relate to uh, new, useful, and non-obvious inventions. Uh, I'm not going to go there. But I want to talk about copyright, trademark, and uh, publicity law because there's some similarities, but they're very different from each other, and they are often confused. Copyright protects original creative expression, and it protects it against what may be loosely called copying. Trademark protects symbols that, con that, that denote authenticity or the source or sponsorship or affiliation of a product or a service. Publicity law relates to the rights of a person to protect against uses of that person's identity, generally name, image, likeness, signature, and voice, against commercial exploitation without authorization. Now, copyright and trademark often get confused because people like to think of plagiarism as a copyright issue. It's not, it's a trademark issue. If a student were to write a five page paper, asked to, to opine upon, upon something in a five page paper in, in college, and the student said, um, the following um, uh, article by George Will, is very instructive, open quotes, and then has five pages of George Will, close quotes, and said, I couldn't have said it better myself, end of paper. That might be a copyright violation, but it's not plagiarism. It's not passing somebody else's work off as yours. So plagiarism and trademark are about source, genuine authenticity of a source or sponsor. Copyright is about taking somebody's creative original expression and reusing it in a fashion with or without authority. So those are the big frameworks. Yeah, so Andrew, you said somebody's. Uh, is an AI a somebody in copyright law? Good, good uh, point. No. So uh, copyright protects original, or it protects works of authorship, and they are original uh, creative expressions rendered in tangible form. So there's a, I have a copyright in what I'm saying now only because it's being recorded. If this were not being recorded, I would have no copyright in what I'm saying, okay? But that's, that's sort of a, a detail. But original works of authorship, which means there must be an author, and that is universally construed to mean a human being. Uh, there's a famous case several years ago of somebody who left his camera out in the jungle and uh, some kind of, not, real, not technically a monkey, but a monkey-like uh, primate came and found the camera and was examining it and uh, accidentally took some amazing selfies of itself. And they were very amusing selfies. And the, uh, the photographer tried to claim that he had a copyright uh, in the photographs. And the answer is no. They were taken by this primate, not by a human being, no authorship. So the same thing applies to artificial- But the uh, primate didn't have a copyright either. Because they're not. The prim, they're, that's right. The primate didn't have a copyright, but I mean, the, uh, 
it was a crazy case and it really was a lawsuit and all sorts of people started piling in. Uh, people, uh, people were trying to claim that they had rights uh, from the monkey or that they were representing the monkey in court. It was insane. But anyway, uh, no, artificial intelligence it is universally understood that AI cannot create an, a work of authorship. Now, humans can use AI um, and depends on how you define AI to create works of authorship. When I use my iPhone, I think there's some artificial intelligence of some description that has gone into the exposure calculations um, or um, let's say if a blind person, I've seen that this is uh, being advertised right now, a blind person wants to take a selfie and holds the cell phone up and the cell phone will tell the blind person whether there's a face in frame and whether there's a face and pet in frame. So that's certainly some assistance along the way, uh, but the person would still probably have copyright in those works even though there is assistance from artificial intelligence. There is human intelligence that, is, that applies. Um, and by the way, creative is pretty minor. Uh, what, what's sufficiently creative in copyright law to be protectable is pretty minor. Uh, I like to say the words arose is not enough. A rose is a rose, probably not enough. A rose is a rose is a rose. I think you're there, okay? Um, there's there's something in creative in that redundancy that I think makes it makes it eligible. Um, and original in the copyright world doesn't mean unique, just means not copied. Okay. So what does copyright law protect against? It protects for our purposes against primarily two different things. One is um, reproduction of a work in whole or in part or creation preparation of a derivative work, which is a new work that is based upon an earlier work. And th there's some weirdness in the second, the preparation of a derivative work, because most courts, if not all, will say that derivative work has to contain something of the original to be a derivative work. And then people say, well, then wouldn't that already violate the reproduction right? Why do you have a derivative works right if uh, you already have a reproduction right if you say a derivative work has to reproduce some of the original? And so to illustrate one of the one of the issues here, uh, I would like to share my screen uh, a matter that I love and I'm I'll wear my views on my sleeve on this. So let me share a screen. Um, Here we go. So this is the well-known charging bull uh, of Wall Street that existed uh, uh, for some time before a new sculptor created Fearless Girl in the foreground as an answer to charging bull. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. Now, arguably, the fearless girl was based upon the bull. It was the, I, at least I, I believe, the incentive came to create a response to the the charging bull. It was designed to be in relationship to charging bull, and so some people might say, "Well, that's a derivative work because." Fearless Girl is a copyrightable work. It is a work. It is based upon, in the loosest sense, another work. But I think it is unrealistic to say that this violates the derivative works right of the uh, sculptor behind Charging Bull. Although, clearly, there was a lot of controversy over this. I don't know whether there was a lawsuit over it, uh, but there's a lot of controversy because the sculptor around Charging Bull, I think, believed that he sort of owned the space around it and had a right to be to have his work protected from encroachment by another work. So that's that's uh, an interesting question on the derivative works right.
Um, the, uh, but an example of a derivative work, um, let me go back to share screen again. Sorry about that. Um, and an, another example um, of something that was very clearly a derivative work. Um, oh, unfortunately, the way the, oh, here we go is um let me find the right tab <laughs> i have to write find the right tab there you go um here we have an associated press news photograph of president obama on the left and then the artist shepherd ferry adapted it to the image on the right for a poster celebrating, and I think it was used as a campaign poster or at least a support poster, which led to a lawsuit which ended up being settled. Uh, it might have been a good fair use case, and I'll describe, I'll discuss fair use. Um, but the question is, was this a, a derivative work, but also was it a reproduction? Um, the, uh, the case that Occupy the Supreme Court recently involved the photograph of Prince on the left and the Andy Warhol uh, rendition on the right based upon the photograph on the left. And so that would implicate both the reproduction right and the derivative works right. And the battle in that case is whether it was fair use. But let me now move to your. How was that decided? Uh, it was decided that, uh, well, and I could spend an hour on this. Uh, it was decided in a somewhat bizarre way. It went up to the Supreme Court, not on the judgment as a whole, but on the uh, analysis of the first of four factors of the fair use doctrine in copyright law. The first factor being the purpose and character of the use. And the Supreme Court did not examine the purpose and character of Warhol's work. They instead decided it would be examining the purpose and character of the license by the Warhol Foundation to Vanity Fair to run it on its cover, which is a bizarre analysis. Sorry. And they found that uh, because essentially it was competing with uh, Ms. Goldsmith over the possibility of placement uh, on magazine covers, that the first factor weighed against fair use which is sort of the death knell of the fair use uh, defense uh, by the Warhol Foundation. But moving to uh, um, the uh, sculpture arena, here we have Jeff Koons. I've forgotten the name of his, not basket full of puppies, or I've forgotten the name of it, but, but something or other puppies, where Jeff Koons took the photo on the left and uh, created a sculpture that you see on the right, uh, clearly based upon it, uh, that decision did not go well for Mr. Coons. Um, so anyway, these are the types of disputes uh, that the art world sees uh, in copyright law. What are the limitations of copyright law? Uh, first, um, it doesn't, protect against independent creation of something that happens to be very similar. So it, it protects only against doing something in relation, specific relation to a plaintiff's work. So you just happen to come up with the same uh, image, very, very similar, uh, no issue. Uh, when Pope Francis appears on a balcony in St. Peter's Square and 10,000 people are there with their phones all taking images of, of the Pope from the balcony. They're all going to be extremely similar to each other and they're not going to be infringing of each other. Um, so independent creation can't be an infringement. Uh, ideas are not protectable under copyright law. And that's where style comes in because style often boils down to an idea or a set of ideas. 
by the way, somebody, uh, uh, Stephen Lippmann mentions, I think that, I think he got the name of the, of the works correct, String of Puppies. Um, anyway, but coming back to this, ideas are not protectable under copyright law. If anything, they are closer to patent than copyright. Um, and then patent would have its own requirements for protectability. Um, but what passes for style is often a set of ideas. Um, I'll come back to style later though. Something that is functional of a useful article is not copyrightable. So a uh, novel design for a bookcase or an original design for a bookcase is not copyrightable. So, so you're saying my fantastic uh, cane handle here is not copyrightable. Well, that, as with everything in the law, it always depends and there's a gray area. So for example, that handle might have its own life as a handle, but as a handle not on something, it is not functional. So the handle itself could be copyrightable as a sculptural work, and then it happens to get put onto a cane and turned into a useful object. Um, but I would probably come down on the side of uh, it being copyrightable. Okay. The as a cane, no, but as as that work that happens to be used as a handle, I think it would be okay. Um, but the functionality limitation sort of makes some craft type products perhaps not copyrightable. The most surprising thing to many people of, of something that's non-copyrightable is apparel. Uh, the dresses that you see on the red carpet at the Golden Globes or the Oscars. They are not copyrightable. Now, fabric designs might be copyrightable because the design on a fabric is not itself functional. Uh, it's artistic, and that would be cr considered to be just the same as an oil painting or a or a lithograph or or a charcoal drawing. So there's some boundaries there. Um, other things that aren't protectable are things that are sort of standard features for one reason or another. For example, if you have a marble sculpture with an arm outstretched, but you need to put a, a support under it because of the weight of the arm, you don't want it to break. That support is not an element that would be taken into consideration in evaluating infringement. Um, similarly, um, certain things that are very, very standard for the genre are elements that are not protectable. So for example, uh, in a motion picture, um, if, uh, if you say somebody copied my scene with the Eiffel Tower in the background, uh, the answer could be, well, they're both romantic comedies set in Paris. It's no, uh -uh. you're not gonna get, you're not gonna claim the Eiffel Tower as a point of similarity. What I've been alluding to here is that part of the process in determining infringement, whether there's been an illegal reproduction, you start with a question of substantial similarity. I mean, well, that's that's the big question. Is it substantially similar to the original? But in doing so, uh, the law will sort of abstract out certain idea components of, a, of the original work or may have, maybe of both works, filter out elements that should be unprotectable and then compare what's left. So you would you would say there better be some similarities in this between these two movies apart from the Eiffel Tower. So that's that's this is one of the limitations of of copyright law. The big limitation of copyright law is fair use. And uh, the purpose of and fair use is not antithetical to copyright. It is meant to, promote the same purposes of copyright, which is to enrich public discourse and to enrich culture by promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. And the law says sometimes on fair use, it's gotta happen because it's better for the environment. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground and I know I've used up a fair amount of time. I wanna skip very briefly over a couple of other aspects. Trademark and advertising law, um, trademark protects source sponsorship. It protects uh, tokens of, of uh, source or sponsorship. 
So a name signature on a piece of sculpture, uh, a brand that's put on a box or a crate that ships sculpture, that functions as a trademark and can be uh, enforced against uh, persons who either misuse that brand or come up with a brand that's too close. Um, but to brand something, you've got to sort of put your name on it or on its packaging. So, you know, I have here a jellyfish sculpture by the Satava studio and on the bottom, it's got Satava uh, written there. Um, and so that's a way of protecting uh, authenticity against uh, under undertakings that may create confusion in the marketplace. So um, what you're saying is every sculptor has to make sure to sign or otherwise indicate that anything that comes out of their studio is theirs. I think it's, I actually think it's extremely important to do so because it trademark is another tool in the toolkit to enforce your rights against people who may be confusing the public as to whether something is yours or not. Um, and you can't rely on style to be your trademark. I mean, there are weird ways in which a restaurant decor, for example, can be an enforceable trademark against other restaurants with similar decor. Uh, there have been uh, cases by artists against other artists saying your style infringes upon my trademark rights in my style. Um, I, I know of one case that went for the plaintiff, it shouldn't have. I see a question here. Does that mean every sculpture should trademark the signature then? No, you don't have to uh, file an application to register a trademark to own a trademark. If you use your name, your name may be functioning as a trademark. Billy Joel is a trademark, for example. Um, so I, but I would make sure to put your name on your sculpture. And you can also do things like putting your name on a shipping crate uh, if you ship the sculpture or things like that. That would create uh, trademark rights. Um, the, um, there can be fair use in trademark, but I'm not going to go into that. I want to talk about publicity rights because publicity rights can affect sculpture two ways. Um, number one, um, an, uh, an artist creating a sculpture may have publicity rights in the sculptor's name. And he wasn't a sculptor, at least for the most part, Andy Warhol would have had publicity rights in his name, may have had trademark rights in his name. Um, and if somebody were to try to pass off a, a fake as an Andy Warhol uh, and to advertise that, he could claim, um, uh, he could file a lawsuit under potentially both trademark law and right of publicity law. But the tricky part for sculptors of publicity law is that the persons depicted in an artwork may claim that they have publicity rights that prevent somebody from using their image in certain commercial ways and could limit the power of an artist in actually creating and, um, and disseminating artworks. Uh, the big limitation on publicity rights there uh, is the First Amendment, because the First Amendment protects the free expression in artistic expression. So what are some of the boundaries here? Uh, the owner of the rights to the, to the images of the Three Stooges sued an artist who had created a charcoal drawing of the Three Stooges and then put that drawing onto t-shirts and sold the t-shirts. And the court ruled that it was a violation of the publicity rights um, in doing so. Uh, and on the other hand, Tiger Woods tried to stop somebody from selling lithographs of a painting of Tiger Woods at a particular, making a particular shot at a particular hole in the masters. Um, and uh, Joe Montana tried to stop the San Jose Mercury News from I think selling posters of a news photo of a Joe Montana catch in a football game and, and the like. Um, Montana lost his, Tiger Woods lost his, the Three Stooges rights owner won their case. Um, the question here is, are you doing something more than sort of trading on the name and reputation 
of the uh, of the celebrity. And these are usually celebrity cases. They don't have to be. At the outer limits of this, Vanna White of Wheel of Fortune fame actually brought and won a lawsuit against Samsung that was trying to advertise how futuristic its VCRs were by running a television ad showing their VCR with the year 2025. Back then, that was a long, long time in the future, not today. It said 2025, and it showed a robot with a wig and a frilly dress standing in front of a game board. And the court held that that violated Vanna, Wright's publi Vanna White's publicity rights because it was her likeness. So there you go. So when you're doing a sculpture, um, uh, yeah, okay. So there's a news photo. Right, um, so I, I can't sculpt this, of course, because of all the logos. I could remove the logos. I still can't sculpt it, though, can I? Well, you may be able to, because if that's your, if you are, if you have a creative statement to make about that, and courts respect your statement, you may be able to do it. Uh, that, yeah, even more, because that would be <laughs> considered more likely to be a commentary on this interaction. Um, again, it's a gray law. This is how lawyers make a lot of money because a lot of cases are not cut and dry. Um, but, but generally speaking, the more that uh, the work is simply trading on the name and reputation of the defendant, um, the more dangerous it is. The more there's a creative input, the, 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 the more that a court believes that there is value and that the effort of the artist is to trade on the value of the creativity, the, the safer the, the artist is likely to be. Uh, so these are some of the um, major issues uh, here. Um, I, I've, I've uh, used a lot of time. I want to uh, make sure to leave time for questions. So I will pause it there and- Be, uh, Before, before we open it up entirely, uh, Andrew, I thought there was some law, particular to visual artists that had the number of 200 in an addition. That's right. Thank, thank you for raising that. There is a weird law that is like a trademark law, but it's in the Copyright Act and it's called the Visual Artists' Rights Act. And it protects um, authors of visual art, which includes sculpture, for the most part. I'll come back to that. Um, and it doesn't give copyright type rights. It's not about reproduction and the like. But it basically gives rights, special rights to uh, visual artists against having their name used without permission on artworks. It also protects them against having anybody modify their works without permission or even destroy works without their permission. And the most famous cases, um, I mean, it does apply to sculpture and sculptures, and I'll come back to the number limitation that Lance referred to. Um, but the most famous case was a mural artist who painted a mural on the side of a building and that was protected and that can actually interfere with remodeling of a building. Um, and so it actually becomes a burden on real estate in that context. Uh, and there was a landlord, I think it was in Brooklyn who ended up getting ordered to pay, I think a couple million dollars uh, for violation of the law uh, because of the destruction or modification of the work. Um, it applies to sculptors where the object of the, where the sculpture is either unique or is limited to 200 signed and numbered copies, or in the case of certain types of sculpture, if they're molded and the like, uh, it may not have to be signed, but needs to be numbered and with a, with some sort of mark that is characteristic of the sculpture, almost like a hallmark of some sort. Uh, what does that mean? It means to me that when you're up, to, when you're up to two hundred, uh, you have a good claim in a publicity type case. Even though I'm shifting grounds here, 
to say, well, this is visual art. This is not commercial promotion. Publicity law uh, may be a riskier problem if you create a sculpture and then create 10,000 posters and sell the posters. Uh, is the person depicted in it going to say, well, you're just selling a, a poster of me and you're you're advertising posters of me. You can't do that. If you're sticking to 200 uh, or fewer uh, in your world, there may be a safer argument there. That's sort of the relevance of that. So one of the questions in the chat was, what if I use Dali or uh, Mid Journey or any of the other AI programs that uh, generate uh, quote art uh, as the starting point for my sculpture? Uh, you can use anything you want as the starting point of your sculpture. There is a risk that if your sculpture ends up looking too much like somebody else's work, then the question is, is this degree of similarity so great to suggest copying? Because independent creation isn't an infringement, but copying can be. So since, since the AI looked at a lot of works that you're worried about some chance that by accident it's uh, served up something to you that you don't know it's the real source of. Well, this is the problem because um, to establish copying as a matter of evidence in court, you look at substantial sim similarity and then you say, but did the person have access to the original to which is similar? If they didn't have access to it, it was just locked up in a library in Timbuktu and nobody ever saw it and it happens to be identical. There's no copying, okay? But uh, George Harrison lost a lawsuit over My Sweet Lord um, because he had it was too similar to another song that he had probably heard on the radio because it had been on the radio. He had no recollection of having heard it. But, oh, it was in the ethos. Um, so he must have had access to it, must have copied it. So it was the copyright infringement. Uh, with AI, it's a little bit untested in court. But if that source was in the data set of the AI, a court may say, well, you had access to it through this AI uh, uh, data set, uh, untested. Um, if um, yeah, That's all I'm going to say on that. It's, it's just a big gray area. But the bottom line is, um, I would always take something, I would always take an AI output because it's going to be non-copyrightable. Right, and then adapt it sufficiently so that it is very clear that the output is your own. A pebble is uncopyrightable, okay? But if I take a whole bunch of pebbles, I can make a mosaic, and that mosaic would be copyrightable. So I think the same sort of theory should apply in starting with an AI foundation, but then changing it enough that somebody that a court or 12 jurors or eight jurors will say, yep, yep, that was clearly Lance's. He might've started with something, but it was his. You know, you create a collage starting with a piece of newspaper. Well, that's not your newspaper, but you can end up with a collage that's unquestionably yours. And it just has to hope it doesn't have a picture of a famous person in it somewhere. Well, that could still happen, but you might have a, that could be a fair, uh, a first amendment. <laughs> okay. And by the way, the more you criticize somebody or attack them, uh, the easier it is to show that it's okay to do it. Again? Run that by me again. The more you criticize somebody, yeah, the fairer your your use of their likeness is. Because you're not trading on their reputation. You are making a public statement. comment, a public statement, a, an opinion, a whatever. 
Fascinating. Okay. <laughs> Oh, good question. What percentage of an artwork or sculpture has to be changed so a person can use something for reference material? This much. This much has to be changed. How useful is that answer? It's not useful. There is no percentage. That's sort of an urban myth that you change something X percent, you're okay. Um, when people try to defend on that basis, it is almost a confession because they are implicitly confessing that they copied from somebody else and then <laughs> changed it, okay? So- That 100 it, minus X is not theirs. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So when they're, um, uh, yeah, you, um, when, when I hear that, I just say, forget it, don't go down that path at all. There is just no percentage that's safe. Somebody asked the question, is there any value in placing a copyright symbol on a sculpture? A tiny bit of value. Copyright notices have not been necessary for protection of copyright since 1988. Um, it sort of puts the world on notice, in the vernacular, on notice, uh, that somebody cares about the copyright. Um, it technically cuts off some defenses, but those defenses are so rare and weak anyway. The bottom line is it never hurts to put it on, but if you, um, um, if you don't wanna put it on for some reason because it makes the signature feel too commercial or something like that, it's not a big deal. So uh, related to that is the, you know, sending it into the uh, patent and trademark office. Or okay. In this instance, it would be in, to the copyright office. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes. And this is important. Copyright registrations are very important. Um, if, uh, first of all, you cannot sue without a registration. So if you're ever going to sue somebody, you need to, if you think you're likely to sue somebody, register the copyright. Um, if you want to claim statutory damages uh, in copyright law, then you better register the copyright um, on a timely basis. And timely means either within three months of first publication or when the work is unpublished, before the infringement begins. Now, publication does not mean what a lot of people think it means. It doesn't mean make public. Uh, if you um, have a sculpture in your studio and you are not offering it for sale, but you're encouraging people to come by your studio and look at it, um, that is an unpublished work. Uh, publication is the, the actual distribution of a physical object by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending or the offer to do so. So if you have not distributed it or offered to distribute or offered to transfer it, to sell it to anybody, it is unpublished. Uh, somebody asked a question, publication equals release date? No. And well, it depends on what you mean by release date. Um, if it's in your studio and hasn't gone anywhere, um, it's not published. And if, if it hasn't gone anywhere and you haven't offered to transfer it or to send it anywhere, um, the um the the if you have offered it for sale even if you haven't sold it then the date of the offer is the date of first publication um okay i don't quite fully understand the context of judy selinsky's um 
uh, question. Oh, photographers threaten. By the way, photographers are really, really, really aggressive. And owners of copyrights in photographs are aggressive. I defended a case once where the claim was for $90 billion. I was defending an uh, online uh, content delivery network uh, service uh, that that does um, manages the data flows for a large number of websites. And the plaintiff was a, a company that owned two websites that together had 600,000 porn images on them. And they claimed that my clients providing the distribution network or the dissemination network was an infringement and it tried to claim $150,000 per photograph for 600,000 photographs. Um, long story short, I could prove that they sort of overlooked part of the law. Even if my client had been liable, which it wasn't, the maximum damages would have been $300,000. Uh, but there are uh, people, there are photographers who set people up for damages claims. Be careful on Wikipedia. Wikipedia photographs are not public domain. Uh, many of them are licensed under Creative Commons, but the license, the particular license says, anything you do with my photograph, you've got to put my notice on, and you have to grant the same light license to everybody downstream, which means that uh, if you create a sculpture that's based on a Wikipedia photograph, um, and you haven't put on the sculpture someplace the uh, attribution to the photo to the photographer with a reference to the right Creative Commons license, then the photographer can sue you. And statutory damages make copyright law in the United States insane uh, because of the $90 billion claim I was talking about. There was one claim against LimeWire by uh, the recording industry where they claimed 5.7 no, five to seven trillion dollars in damages. And a single mother in Minneapolis who was held to have illegally downloaded 24 songs with a value of under $24. A jury came back with a verdict against her of $1.5 million. Statutory damages are available. Uh, even without showing any absolute harm, it's sort of a magic number that you can claim under copyright law that may have no basis in, no correlation with reality. Um, and they are uh, an example of sort of copyright law gone amok. Uh, I actually believe that the stress that extraordinary statutory damages place on copyright law has, has caused courts sort of to uh, change how they might actually interpret the substance of copyright law uh, to avoid ridiculous statutory damages claims. Uh, Lawrence Bechtel's question. If you take a, somebody, uh, take a photograph of somebody you see in passing, they will not have copyright in it. Although it's very clever, some celebrities, when they see paparazzi whom they don't like, uh, taking a picture of them coming out of a restaurant, the celebrities will strike a pose like this deliberately for the photographer. And then when the photographer tries to sell the photographs, the celebrities will say, but this was a joint work. You and I cooperated in that photograph of that, of that pose. So <laughs> I am a co-photographer with you and you owe me 50% of your profits from the sale of the photograph. But no, the the subjects of the photograph may have publicity rights, but not copyright rights. I'm trying to see if I have other questions here. Uh, if you post a photo of a sculpture online, is that not publication? It's a great question. Um, and I have actually posed this question explicitly and bluntly to the general counsel of the US Copyright Office at a major forum on, on debating the distribution right, because distribution and publication are related, and the person would not answer. Here's my answer. If it's online only, not published. If it's online with a little 
printer icon and you're making it easy for somebody to print that web page, then I think you're perhaps offering to distribute because the distribution by allowing somebody to print it and now you've got a material object. Um, I think you can argue that that is a publication, but even that is a gray area. A question about using a, uh, getting a release uh, for a sculpture. It's careful to do so. Do you have to? I don't think so. But it depends. I mean, if if you're going to end up, um, you know, if if it's a pretty straightforward sculpture of a baseball player, and you're going to sit outside the stadium, and you've now made through three D printing uh, ten thousand copies of your of your sculpture, and you're selling them outside a baseball stadium to fans coming out of the out of the uh, stadium, you better have a release for that one. Publicity rights generally apply to advertising or promotion. And that wouldn't be necessarily the sculpture itself, but then anything you do to advertise the sculpture could be considered over the line. Any other questions? And I'm, I'm happy to make myself available if people have follow-up questions afterwards. Um, it's a, it's a, um, complicated, uh, set of laws, copyright law, uh, is, I will say this, um, never believe anything anybody says on social media about copyright law. There is more, uh, ignorant, uh, information that gets disseminated. It is sad, but true. If, if you don't know who a person is and you look at their answer and you're trying to figure out if they're an expert or not, the mo they are more likely to be an expert if the answer is either I don't know or it depends. <laughs> I think that's a perfect note to end on. Yeah. By the way, I would just one little note. I would say to my young associates who would really frustrate their clients and the clients would pose this question and the associate, the young associate would say, I don't know. And the, and the, client says, well, damn it, get me somebody who knows, or I'm not paying you X dollars per hour that you don't know. So I teach them what you say is based on my education, my years of training, and my experience in the field, I can assure you with complete assurance that the outcome is uncertain. That's my version of I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess you can copyright that because it has some creativity <laughs> in it. <laughs> well, okay. Lance and Andrew, thank you so much. We've we've taken up more than an hour of your time, and you've been amazingly generous. Happy to do it. Happy it's to fascinating. do it. Fascinating. If anyone uh -huh. has a, a question in the middle of the night, just email us, and we'll try and get you an answer tomorrow. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. So. Um, really, really great. appreciate it. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. It was, it was an Thank honor you. to be asked to do this. Thanks. Okay. Right. Have, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's to all. <laughs> all right. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.